Everything is connected on the planet. The forest from the leaves that capture the moisture from the clouds and the rainfall that falls down into the streams and it goes out to the sea. And from the fish that come up from the sea and go back up to feed the people who are living on the land. And people need to realize that there are these connections and so the actions that we're doing as humans on the land are going to have consequences to what happens in the water and then what happens in the downstream oceans. There's this term called vanua, and it means of people and place. And it's a concept that recognizes the interconnectedness of social and cultural and biological factors on health and well-being. It's that deeper holistic understanding of health of place that we're trying to impart or relearn, in fact, from a lot of traditional knowledge types. So many traditional understandings already implicitly have this interconnected understanding about health and well-being. We've kind of veered away from that, so we're trying to relearn it in some ways. Every one of us, we have part to play, and particularly those that live and own the uh, watershed areas, is that everything that you do, every activity you do on the uh, mountains or the ridges, will have an impact right down to the, uh, the reefs. It's going to affect our coral reef health. It, it health is going to affect the uh, downstream communities. And that uh, impact is around, you know, the risks of getting waterborne diseases as well as uh, you know, creating those sediments into the uh, waterways. So when we modify those catchment areas, we need to be careful that, um, you know, for our future generation is going to impact them. And I think this is a chance now to uh, you know, get people to start thinking seriously about, you know, the land use activities. You know, they need to do it in a sustainable way so that it doesn't uh, affect or impact the future generations. Eh? The Leptospira bacteria, or pathogen, and the typhoid pathogen. So we're trying to find these pathogens out there in the environment. So the baseline included household surveys, but also we took samples of water, sediment, even the latrine, the toilets, uh, we took swabs to find these pathogens. Eh? Up until now, we're still uh, undergoing laboratory tests. Uh, we're coming down to what uh, community of pathogens are there in those samples. We're thinking of these living things, you know, they, they've been here for, you know, as, as the world exists, they also exist. Eh? And this competition thing comes up. To compete, they need resources and all this. So it comes down to our adaptation, how we survive, how we adapt to our environment. So as we develop, we not only develop, we also disrupt of these biodiversities. So when we disrupt them, where do they go? How do they adapt to the new environment? So from my understanding that, you know, we've been clearing a lot of forestry for, for farming. So there could be millions of uh, biodiversity, meaning there could be a lot of fungus, could be a lot of bacteria, could be a lot of viruses. So when you clear those, where do they go? They could jump, they could evaporate. So they, are, they, have, they do have a form of transportation in, in men. So they jump to mammals or whatever, insects or even to fishes. So they do have, have alternative ways of uh, trying to survive. If it's basically what, you know, interfering with, uh, with an environment, since it, it has a biodiverse living things, where do they go after clearing uh, the, that environment? Those biofilms are shaped and created as a result of the conditions of the catchment. So the higher amounts of nutrients creates more algae. The condition of sanitation like determines how much uh, pathogens are getting into the waterway. Those can all sit in those, those uh, sediment patches, biofilms. Also, they can form on the insides of pipes and so forth, and they become reservoirs for pathogens that people get ill from. With the Wish Fiji project now, uh, we're dealing with uh, communities that have 
untreated water. So it's straight from nature. And as soon as they see clear water, then they just go, okay, that's safe. It's clear, it's cold, it's safe to drink. So when we've done our testing, we see that they're actually like the things like turbidity. When we do the testing, you see it's above, but they're still drinking it and they just consider it as safe drinking water for the villagers. But then we know because we've, we've got the equipment and the testing to actually tell us what we're what we're seeing. Like it gives us like a story of what that what that water or that river system is by these tests. We've also found during those uh, during those studies and those surveys that they, uh, they have about 16 to 17 risk factors. When I say risk factors, these are, uh, these are risks that uh, potentially the spread of or the transmission of these pathogens in the environment to people. And that includes the water they drink, the drains, the rivers, you know, uh, some of behavioral uh, aspects of their lives, eh? washing in rivers or keeping animals or livestock next to river systems. Uh, and them been interacting with the livestock as well. And, and these are risk factors that we have come to address with them. And they've, at, at that point, they've come up with uh, some of the improvement plans. It's a slow change. It doesn't necessarily happen all at once. And so people don't necessarily pick up on that if they're clearing the land too close to the water, that the sediments are getting in and that's causing impacts downstream. Doesn't typically happen suddenly. Um, so once things have changed and it's so slow to change, uh, people don't realize what it was because what it was is so long ago and they're only looking at the now and they get used to the fact that all oh, the water's a little bit dirty, oh, we're a little bit sick sometimes, oh, we can't find all the food that we need and now we have to go to this store and eat some other things. Um, so what we want to do is restore what was there or preserve what's there now so that people will still be able to undertake cultural practice, they'll still be healthy, they'll still be able to have all the resources that they need to undertake cultural practice and to you know, feel like they belong to the land that is their home. We are contaminating our water <laughs> before uh, from uh, planting over the source eh? and uh, we don't care about when uh, it's rain we we just uh, stay we feel lazy to come up and clean up clean the dam
Bolatena, Volacu, and Calabanga taking away Volacu. Go here some tuna in a coro, two Volacu, two no wash. A vocal of Taki Nanandra Zagazanamarama. She forgot to let the Kendana to Ranga. Low Roman and the other and Zuma to Sumai. A Calabar or take me away weekend. Like for the past um, four months now, there's still no illness from drinking the water. I hope for a hundred percent healthy drinking water. After they helped us with our um, uh, like the mean from the rest of what down eh? Maro te ki bolibu te kana sa ya na visa una mono go. Una kere re re ki mo mia awa re ve na ngau na tau mande. Mano sa ambasi ka miki na na vivo ki ne ne mbale ta na awai. Ki bem ja u e u nu re u sa re ve ndore visa u le bu sa kote ni. E kote ta na mi dora mo e vingu le. Ki bem mi poka sa la ta ki na bu ni mon man na ose na bulu makau ka na nam na so ta na na mono na mono mono la la e da u kuni e na bonu a ti u ki na ne ni mami vur vur ni wai ke na vur vur ni mbula e ki do do bo na ta ne le bu ni bo ka sa la e da u soli mai e le bu na vi ka la la ki me da u ba ka wa le ta ka tu da u soli mai na ke ne bo ka sa la ki me mzang ga da u ki la oi na mbula ngo This, the story of our work in Fiji and around the region in trying to work with people to think about management from the tops of the forest through the rivers all the way down to the sea is that we found a lot of evidence through different assessments that we did that actions on the land, clearing the forests, clearing the trees around the rivers was affecting the availability of fish in the rivers as well as downstream on the coral reefs. We, sent that information back to the communities. We presented back scientific data. We created comic books. We had puppet shows and people were interested and a little bit sad, but it didn't necessarily change any behavior on the land. What we started noticing after really large flooding events is that people would get sick and there would be these outbreaks of water-related diseases like typhoid and leptospirosis. And it seemed to be incurring in areas where people had heavily altered the watersheds. They cleared the land, there was a lot of livestock, built dams and changed the hydrology of the rivers. And so over the next few years, we did some more research and we found evidence that in fact, some of those changes are associated with increases in these types of diseases that are making people sick, like typhoid and leptospirosis. They're bacterial diseases. They can be transmitted um, if bacteria gets into contaminated food and water. And it was this watershed moment of, okay, well, if it's some of the same factors that are we know are causing downstream impacts to freshwater and marine systems are also causing disease in people, wouldn't you be more likely to do something about it? Wouldn't you be more likely to change your behavior on the land in terms of what you're doing and the decisions you make if it would reduce the risk of your kids getting sick? I think one of the things we have done to simplify you know, all that science and bring that message down to the communities uh, is the use of uh, something that we call uh, infographics in, into flip charts that we've used so that they could views, uh, visualize some of these uh, unsustainable land use activities that are happening on the ground and then they can relate to that. And also we to use a lot of uh, you know, icons and pictures you know, so that it can, the message can be taken across instead of you know, using all those technical words and jargons. And so we've made it simple and we've had that follow session one-to-one, -one, you know, mainly around the uh, Kawa Bowl or the Kawa ta Tanua, and so that they can open up and relate to us, you know, what they're actually going through on the ground. We saw that they had moved all of the livestock out of the village, put them all in one paddock and fenced it off. And so, anecdotally at least at this point, there hasn't been lepto for a while there in those adjacent villages. It's hard to attribute one to the other, but the risks for contamination of the water source has been reduced significantly, right? And so it's through their own process of dialogue 
and some evidence from our baseline information, they've made some decisions collectively as a group of communities to do this, which is going to improve their health and well-being. The thing is, uh, one thing that uh, we have come together, sometimes we have this uh, better relationship between Grinders, that they would like everybody want to do their part, but now at least this water has brought three of our business together. I think from uh, in the future, we have any, anything we can do, it will really be good. We are working hand in hand. Eh? So these three businesses, they follow, they respect each other. With this work we have done, these three days, make sure it will bind us. Uh, in retrospect, when uh, we were able to uh, present what the project was about, we had uh, representatives from the Ministry of Health, uh, the Water Authority, uh, the government uh, government departments like the Itau Affairs uh, Ministry. And uh, with that, we provided criteria for the selection of the sites. Uh, one criteria was that uh, these cases had a prevalence over, over th from 2013 Till 2016, they had prevalence of leptospirosis, typhoid, and dengue. Uh, the second one is that they have wash issues uh, with their communities. Uh, also, that five to six villages were located along one river system. As part of the project, we also do interventions, eh? uh, but the interventions are specifically targeted at addressing uh, risk factors to do with disease transmission. Let's say, for example, for this village, Narayal, we are implementing, uh, we're upgrading. Uh, drinking water infrastructure, which is their dam, eh? so, uh, a whole new uh, drinking water supply system, whole new dam, uh, just to improve the to improve drinking water safety, uh, water access as well eh? for the communities. We're trying to get people to think of themselves as part of the whole system, part of the system that is there ridge to reef area, part of the system that's part of the planet. And there are all of these connections between the actions that individuals do, the actions that people take as a community, how people interact with the environment and the animals and the plants around them. It's, it's all connected like this. And if you start breaking some of those connections, you lose the health of you and you lose the health of the environment. And your, your health is built on health and environment, especially for people who are living in remote areas and are so fundamentally dependent on clean water systems that's running off the land, on the natural resources for their food. The Pacific region covers about almost a third of the Earth's surface. Pacific islands are in direct control of about 20% of the world's oceans. The primary determinant of climate are the oceans. The decisions that Pacific Island leaders make now has an impact on the rest of the world and humanity. This is no longer a region of small island states. This is large ocean states. We have to be able to flip this narrative from a colonially imposed a uh, narrative of vulnerability to one of empowerment and one of strength in unity and strength as a region and importance in the region for the health of the planet because a disproportionate part of the world's oceans are managed by the Pacific Island countries which has an enormous role in the state of the planet going forward. The WISH project has taught us also very strongly about community engagement. We really needed to look at um, building our capacity to uh, invest in communicable disease or infectious disease research and also do capacity building for our own staff. And we are very fortunate that over the past three to four years, in the area of communicable disease research or infectious disease research, we have a number of externally funded projects that 
are geared towards answering questions that are related to infectious diseases. So the Watershed Interventions for Systems Health uh, project is based in rural communities and it is again looking at water sensitive diseases and I think the background of that project is geared towards addressing the problem with uh, leptospirosis, typhoid and dengue and diarrheal diseases. So these continue to be endemic in a country like Fiji, but I think also in the Pacific region we continue to have those. But they're very preventable and you know we can do these by simple things like water sanitation and hygiene uh, practices. But unfortunately, um, they continue to be endemic and it continues to also even cause deaths among people. The systems approach to watershed management that we've been taking is really novel. And you could say that it's been a pilot and we've had some resources to be able to work with communities and government to look at doing all these different types of actions in watershed to improve environmental health and community health. But really for long-term success, we're going to need a bigger pot of funds. It takes a long time in order to be able to achieve impact. It takes a long time from trees to grow, from saplings all the way up to maturity for the water quality to change downstream and for us to be able to see these changes in the environment in positive ways so we have positive feedbacks on human health. It's not something that any group can do alone. We need to see partnerships across all of the different sectors in government, partnerships with the private sector, partnerships with the communities. And so everyone has a voice and is working together and is able to have enough resources to plan to do things, to change what housing materials look like and, and the toilets in the villages, to change how animals are managed within the context of the community, to build better village dams and water systems so that we're not having leaks and we're not seeing problems in terms of bacterial pathogens getting into pipes. And then really to be able to look after the environment, to protect while it's still where it's still intact, and then to be able to restore places where it is degraded in order to have clean, secure water for the environment and for human health.